Uh, this is Carissa Explains It All Conspicuous Consumption. I'm going to give you the phone of controlling. The phone of controlling. And we'll let you drive for a while. Good, because it's been so long since I put this slide together, I'm not entirely sure what I put in here anymore. We did. We took a couple weeks off. We did. We, we slacked off for a while. Okay, so conspicuous consumption. I was making records. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what we'll call it. <laughs> Definition and origin. The spending of money on and the acquisition of luxury goods and services to publicly display economic power as a means of either attaining or maintaining a given social status. I.e., I'm a rich guy. See how rich I am. Therefore, I am a leader. Keep or going. I'm trying to give the impression of a rich guy. Yes. Yes. Uh, the term was introduced by economist and sociologist Thorstein Veblen. Yep. In his book, The Th Theory of the Leisure Class, an Economic Study in the Evolution of Institutions. Yep. Back in 1899. And it is as poignant today as it ever has been. Yes. This, the, in Europe, they deal with a lot of class issues on a political level, and they're very aware of class. Americans, we seem to be less in tune with the struggles between cla classes. So, all right. Right. So, history. Veblen used the term to describe the people of the upper class who used their wealth as a way of publicly manifesting their social power and prestige, either real or perceived. In the 20th century, the emergence of the middle class, due to the significant improvement of the material standard of living, applied the term to people whose income allowed them to buy things for prestige rather than the utility of the goods and services. Yeah. The, the most, like you have it pictured here, the most obvious example is a car. I, I remember working with a guy and he bought a used Mercedes, uh, a C-Class. I think it was a 240. Okay. And he was very proud of the car. He was very happy with the car. He got it for a very reasonable price, about the price of like a new Honda Civic. And he was constant. he was working on it and working on it and working on it. But he was just so happy because his wife had gotten a promotion and they wanted a car with more prestige, which to me is silly. But this is, this is why luxury auto manufacturers exist because sure. – when I bought my car, it was, you know, how much do you think your car should make a social statement about who you are and how much, you know, a, a car should really project my, you know, all these things. I'm like, no, I bought the car because it was the cheapest new car you could buy in America. Yeah, I was going to say when I bought mine, it was uh, what's well, cheap and efficient and will get me where I need to go. <laughs> but that's the way we view it. Sure. But, yeah, I mean, if you're in the market for a Mercedes, you're probably more likely to answer yes to those questions that, like, a car shows who I am. So – Does it show who you are or show who you want to be? Well, I'm not going to judge people for spending their money, how they're going to spend it. But, yeah, that's the idea. Um, in fact, in, the, like, the 20s, in the Gilded Age, some of the greatest car – these beautiful, big automobiles with 12-cylinder motors and things – were ro roaring down the street at a whopping 40 miles an hour, but that was like being able to do a buck 20 down the street today. Um, but, but, you yeah. know, these cars also got, what, six miles to the gallon? Oh, that? If, if that. <laughs> so it's really a – but this was in an era where oil was cheap, and if you were wealthy, who cared? Gas could have been anything that would have paid it. It was all about – it was all about it was about everything but the the transportation. Yeah. And we we experience this in all sorts of ways, but cars are the the easiest one to point to. Mm -hmm. But guitars, amplifiers, all these things, sure. that, you know. I mean, I'm sitting in a room full of stuff and you guys take me seriously because of it. I understand. I, if you're really into your car, be really into your car. Yep. All right. So sociology. Now, this was thought to compromise, comprise socioeconomic behaviors practiced by rich people, but the economic research indicated that it was a socioeconomic behavior common to poor social classes and economic groups and in the societies of countries with emerging economies. Right. 
So we had this idea of like diamond covered everything. Like we see here on the picture, the uh, the golden MacBook. <laughs> right? It seems so opulent, but you'll never <laughs> catch somebody with actual money bopping around with one of those. Or right. Maybe somebody who's really interested in showing how much money they have. Right, right. Because, I mean, that's that's something that sticks out like a sore thumb. Yep. In okay. in the exact same way that big chrome rims do. It's just – it. it this manifests – Across all cultures, the 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 aspirant, the up, the rising, tend to to have great displays of opulence. Okay. Um. Apparently, your dad's in Florida. Cool. <laughs> okay. So, among such people, displays of wealth are used to psychologically combat the impression of poverty. In the Millionaire Next Door, the surprising secrets of America's wealthy. Thomas J. Stanley and William D. Dank reported that American millionaires are more likely to practice frugality than conspicuous consumption. Duh, they didn't. They didn't get rich spending all right. Of it. Look, look at Warren Buffett. Yep, Warren Buffett is like the best example of this. Or He's, Steve Jobs with his turtlenecks and jeans. It's still not an expensive <laughs> suit. I'm thinking Warren Buffett's still living in the house he bought in Omaha in the '60s for five figures. You know, when he can afford literally anything right. on the planet. Right. It's a lot of that's a lot of that's cultural. So sure. You know, that's that's yep. what sociology is. Yep. Culture. Now we move on to conspicuous compassion, which is the practice of publicly donating large amounts of money to charity in order to enhance the social prestige of the donor. Yep, that's why they're great big checks. Uh huh. It's a type of conspicuous consumption, and this behavior has long been recognized and occasionally attacked. For you don't know New Testament story, do you know the story? Kind of. It's been a long time. Yeah. It. Okay. It, it's bas- basically the gist of it is, it's it's better for it's it's more impressive if you're poor and giving a little bit to charity than if you're you know rich and like openly giving a lot to charity. Right. And all of a sudden, our levels are changing drastically again. Why are our levels changing? They just do. (laughs) Okay. And, of course, the best example of conspicuous consumption. Well, yeah, because Donald Trump, you know, if you think about his – how he came up in New York, his dad was – his dad became immensely wealthy. But Donald Trump was more interested in showing how wealthy he was. His dad was more interested in acquiring it. And Trump was more interested in exploiting it. So, of course, he's got that mansion that looks yeah. like – that penthouse that looks like Versailles. Yep. Yeah. So that's conspicuous consumption. And, I mean, in many ways, you guys are are watching this show and you do. You take me seriously because I've got a room full of high-end stuff, you know. Well, mid-range stuff. But <laughs> it's a room full of stuff and I've got all the equipment and but, to but the gear nerds. That it. makes me a leader. You use it. Sure. You know, you're not you're not just acquiring it to make yourself look impressive. You it, know, that's just a like a bonus. That happens a lot in the retro gaming community. Is you get guys they'll buy shelves of games that they never play. That they just, never play just, because just to give them credit or whatever. Right. Ugh. But you know that's why one day we'll have to do our walkthrough of the DVD collection. <laughs> Yes, the DVD b- collection that we bought on cheap. <laughs> we did. We bought most DVDs for less than $5. Yep. But even still, it was a huge undertaking to build that collection. Well, at the time, we didn't have – well, one, There we was didn't no have, Netflix. There's no Netflix. We didn't have room to buy much other than DVDs. And, you know, we could buy them, you know, $20 worth at a time and come out with like five of the darn things. Right. Right, so we built we've built quite a DVD collection, and between yes. the two of us, we have quite the CD collection. Yes, you know, but that just doesn't look quite as impressive on our wall. Well, it doesn't quite take a wall either. 
Well, it doesn't take a wall because we didn't put enough shelves up for that one. <laughs> no, even if you put them all up, there's not enough CDs to fill a wall. There's enough DVDs. But mm-hmm. the the point of the matter is, is, you know, just because somebody has a lot of stuff, just because mm-hmm. I've got this room full of stuff doesn't mean that I know what I'm talking about. Right. It means I have the stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I do out- – I output. Yes. So you can check to see if I know what I'm talking about. Sure. But – the long and short of it is that people are emotionally ready to treat you to, – to accept you as a leader if you have these displays of opulence. It's really strange how that works. When you're a car guy, it's really the guy who rolls in with the nicest car. Everybody kind of stops and looks and wants to know that guy and that's how you become a leader. It's weird. But – you got to find the thing that you're that you're doing and remember the the consumer culture drives us all to do this but you don't have to participate in any way right you know nobody actually needs a tv in every room well except me no you just have a tv in every room i we do don't, we don't need them we don't use half of them no we really don't cuz i don't get a We'll talk about that later in another section, uh, our media consumption versus creation. But, uh, okay, let's move on. What's next? 